my new best friend right here, Tom. A very enthusiastic fellow right here. He came up to me and he said, if you've been there for 20 years, you must have been 10. <laughs> oh, okay. Actually, I've been there, I think, 25 years because I was a youth pastor first. And uh, my pastor set me up. He retired on me. <laughs> so we're so uh, thank you for the uh, uh, invitation. I appreciate Pastor Jeff. I admire pastors because I know it's not easy. And so I love when I uh, see people like Pastor Jeff have pastored for a long time. I'm not trying to say you're older than me, but yeah. so, but when he when he called and he invited me, um, and he said Florida, I didn't hear anything else after Florida. Says, yes, pack your bags, honey. Just we're, we're going. So we love Florida too. Uh, my mother-in-law and father-in-law are here with my wife. They uh, they migrate to Florida like many of you guys do in the winter, and so we haven't seen them since Christmas. So they made the drive down from Leesburg. And, uh, but my family, we love Florida. We come down at least uh, once, a, once a year, but never in this area. So uh, I don't know where I am, really. And uh, so if all of you left, I, I'd be lost. I uh, was picked up at the airport, and uh, we, we were taken out to eat at a restaurant. And I met a really nice fellow. I don't know if Mike, I don't know if you're here or not. I hope you are here. I, re- I met a nice fellow at a restaurant. He asked me while I was, why I was here, and I told him that I was preaching down at Anchor Christian Church, and I invited him to come, and he asked me where it was, and I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it is. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I said, I don't know where I am right now. You know, I bet if you look it up, though, you can find it, and I hope you come and join us. So, Mike, I hope you're here. I don't know. And, um, but we are we're thankful to be here. Of course, I didn't bring all my family, but I did bring this picture because uh, I love my family, and I like to share them with you. So to my right, so, so I'm from Kentucky. Anybody else from Kentucky here? Okay, so if you need translators, <laughs> you see these hands, if you need translators, they will help you. Uh, but my two boys, they are Kentucky boys, so you notice they, they don't ever take their hat off, and they're Wrangler-wearing, boot, cowboy boot-wearing boys. So the one to the right, he's 24, uh, right? 24, will be 24, and, uh, and he, he's married, I did his wedding in the summer, and so that uh, beautiful young lady in front of him, um, and she, I know she looks young, but she is young enough, uh, she is old enough to be married, she's, she's a nurse, and uh, so that's our, our, our newest daughter, she's a nurse, try, going to school to be a, a nurse practitioner, and, and Seth, my son, is a firefighter, and then my other boy, there with the hat on to my to my to my left um he'll be 20 next week and then the young lady in the white um that's our soon to be 18 year old daughter she's a senior in in high school uh, about ready to graduate and then um of course you see our our beautiful daughter that we adopted from haiti that's kamisha and then the young lady i have my arm around that's uh that's my wife and uh i think i think we've been married 20 almost 26 years, and uh, I probably got that wrong, but uh, I'll find out. But anyways, uh, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my wife said, asked me if, how I was feeling about this, and I said, you know, actually, I'm nervous. So even though I, I've pastored for over 20 years and been preaching for 28 years, I still get nervous. And um, also, being a guest, I never get out of my trench, I call it, my trench of Taylorsville. I have a lot of opportunities there, so I'm never a guest speaker. So um, you're getting, I, I'm getting a better end of this deal, because I get Florida, and you get me. <laughs> um, so anyways, my wife said, so how are you feeling about it? I said, I'm a little nervous, and, and she offered me some words of advice. She said, hey, listen, just don't, don't try to be smart or, or eloquent or funny or clever just be you. <laughs> there was some delayed laughs in that right there. It's okay. That's okay. I got you. And, uh, and so I want to I want to share with you. I just want you to um, I want you to think about the cross 
for just a few moments. And I want you to just put your imagination hats on, if you will. I'm, I'm very visual, and, and men, men, we are mostly, we, we talked about this yesterday, we speak a different language than the ladies do. And all the wives said, amen. I heard it already. She was ahead of me. And all the wives said, amen, right? And so uh, most of us men were, were very visual. But ladies, uh, join in with me, if you would. Just put your imagination hat on. I want, you to, I want you to look at the cross with me for a moment. I want you to take a close look, if you will. I want you to focus and zero in on this, this wooden beam, this wooden beam. It's a, I want you to see it. It's a, it's a rough cut piece of wood. And if you look, if you look close, you'll see the imperfections. You'll see the, you'll see the cracks, and you'll, you'll, you'll see if you, if you feel it. You, you can smell it. You can feel it. And if you feel it, you can, you can, you can feel the texture. And if, and if you rub your hands across it, if you're not careful, you can even, you can pick up some splinters. So I want you to imagine that. I want you to imagine that on your skin. And as you're, as you're focusing in on this, the, 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 the cross, the cross was a brutal method of capital punishment. For us, we think of capital punishment, we think more about, we're more accustomed to thinking about an electric chair or a lethal injection through a needle. But this, this cross, this, this method, it was, it was where the condemned criminal is tied or nailed to a large wooden beam or a stake. And the criminal was left to hang until, until they would eventually die. And it, this form of punishment was, was used by the Romans as others, but it was used by the Romans as a, as a symbol of control of fear, of, of power to dissuade any future would-be criminals. The length of time that it would take for a, a person to die in this way would range from hours to days. Depending on the method, there was different methods. Depending on the victim's health. Depending on the... Uh, environment of the time that they're they're hanging there and then there's causes of death that range from many believe death came from asphyxiation due to the hyper extension of the chest and the pressure on the lungs and trying to raise up to breathe heart failure hypovolemic shock dehydration, pulmonary embolism, or infection due to the wounds. Or death could be possibly a combination of all of those. And that would play into how long. I'm thankful that Jesus did not hang there for days. We know he was there for a matter of hours due to the overwhelming abuse due to his wounds that he suffered. The cross is intended to provide death in a slow, painful, gruesome, and humiliating, as it was done in the public eye. The crucifixion tended to draw big crowds, but especially the day that Jesus was crucified, there was the Passover, there was um, the feast, the festival where many would travel into the holy city. And there was this famous teacher. As you know, Jesus drew a crowd. His popularity had grown. So there was a crowd there. And again, these took place to dissuade any would-be future criminals as there are two criminals that are crucified with Jesus. Luke chapter 23, we see this. Two other men, both criminals, were 
also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the Skull, of Calvary, they crucified him there along with the criminals. One on his right, the other on his left. Now it's speculated these weren't just common thieves. Perhaps um, it was armed robbery. Perhaps they had murdered someone in their efforts uh, to steal. For here they've been condemned to death. This would have taken place outside the city walls, outside of Jerusalem, where, where all would see as they're traveling in and out. And during this crucifixion, Jesus is practicing what he preaches to us. He's praying for his enemies. Not an easy thing to do, is it? And right in the middle, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And even while he's praying for them, they're, they're dividing his clothes by casting the lots. And the people stood watching. And the rulers of the time and the religious leaders, they sneered at him. And they said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and, and mocked him, and they offered him wine vinegar. And, and they said, if you are the king of Jews, sarcastically, save yourself. And they hung a sign above him. This is the king of the Jews. And of course, the majority of the Jewish folks at that time would not have appreciated that as well. And then verse 39, we get to the two criminals. One criminal who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked that criminal. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you and I are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus in conversation and he says this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, most of you probably know this story. It represents two contrasts and how people view the cross. Even today, even what today represents as the triumphal entry of Jesus entered into the city and many were... Um, Hosanna, Hosanna, and we know in just a few days, many of that will turn into crucify, crucify. And Paul talks about these contrasts. In 1 Corinthians, we, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the message of God is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God of God. So let me share quickly with you just three thoughts on this this morning. As we look at criminal number one, I'll we'll call him criminal number one. He's the first one that speaks according to the passage. I guess to him, or in Kentucky, I would say we, I reckon, I reckon the cross was foolishness because he's defiant even arrogant, as the religious leaders were. Pride keeps us from coming to Jesus. I'm always so intrigued by the story of Nicodemus because of his position in the Sanhedrin as, a, as an elite noble statesman. 
someone with a lot of influence, a lot of power. And you see in Scripture, I always feel like he's seeking. He admits that, Jesus, you must be of God because no one could do what you do. But he would seek him at nighttime when no one, his colleagues wouldn't see him. And then there's another time when he speaks up to defend Jesus and his colleagues blast him. What are you, a, a disciple of Jesus as well? And then he pipes down, he, he retreats. And then we see him after the death of Jesus, him and another fella, Joseph, who are taking the body uh, to bury it, which seems like a noble cause, but they're more known as the secret followers of Jesus. He was never able to seem like, I, I don't know, we don't know, I don't know what happened to him later, but we never seemed to, he never seemed to be able to lay down his pride all the way. I was kind of rooted for him. But Corinthians goes on to say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. But we preach Christ, crucified which is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And it's still today for many, it's a stumbling block or it seems foolishness. And again, our, our pride causes us sometimes to not accept Jesus as the Son of God who came to die for our sins, who rose again to provide a way for us to have life and life eternal. And James chapter 4 deals with our pride in one short, strong sentence. He says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. How many of you want the favor of God? We have to humble ourselves. Criminal number one wasn't humble. Criminal number two, though, we see a man to me, seems humble or remorseful or maybe desperate. And to him, the cross represents salvation. And he seemed repented. Acts 3.19 teaches us to repent then and turn to God. It's a change of our thinking, a change of our behavior. To repent, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped away. Peter said, you remember, he, he stood up and he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So salvation, forgiveness only comes through Jesus. There's a Scottish-born pastor who pastors in Ohio, and I love his accent. Have any of you ever heard of Alistair Begg? He's, he's got this, um, it's about a four-minute clip that's floating around in social media world. And, and, I, and I love it. I think it's powerful. And I can't do it as well as he did, but I would encourage you to go find it. But he's asked about the thief on the cross. I, I believe it, that's how it starts. And, but anyways, I know he says, he says, I can't wait to get to heaven and find that guy. To find that guy on the, on the cross, to imagine what that must be like the day that the thief on the cross showed up in heaven and he went to the angel and the angel looked at him and said, what are you doing here? And he was like me at the restaurant the other night, not knowing where I was. And the thief on the cross says, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't, I just, I don't know. And the angel's confused. I said, let me go get my supervisor. And he goes against the supervisor, angel, and angel comes over and he says, well, what are you doing here? And I said, I don't know. And he said, okay, well, we got to ask you some, some, some questions. You know, what, you understand the doctrine of justification by faith? Never heard of it. What, 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 what do you mean you never heard of it? And so, so here we have a man at the end of his life who probably never attended a Bible study, who, who probably never attended a church service, and, 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 and never had the opportunity to be baptized. 
It's, it's baffling sometimes in our, in our uh, theological discussions, uh, right? Well, what do we do with this guy? We, see, we want to think, or we're prone to be drawn back to being a good person in our deeds. And don't get me wrong, deeds are great. We should do those, absolutely. But if you think that's what gets you into heaven, then you've mistaken. And they continue to question the thief on the cross. Uh, it's just a story, right? And then finally, out of frustration, we, we can just imagine him saying, all I know is this. The man on the middle cross said I could come. The man on the middle cross said I could come. And you think about Ephesians. When we're told that we're saved by grace, by our faith in Jesus Christ, grace alone, and not by our good works that we could boast and brag, but we're only saved and made alive in Christ through our faith, through surrendering our life to Him. And Ephesians also tells us that He has created us to do good works. But man, the thief on the cross shows us the grace of God. In those final moments, and we learn in Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. And then it goes on to say, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not might be, can be, should be, will be saved. And Jesus talks about paradise. He talks about heaven with his disciples. And even after three years of hanging out with Jesus, they never seem to completely understand what's going on. And Jesus is telling his disciples in John 14, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare this place for you, surely I will come again to take you to where I am so that where I am, you may be. And you know the way to get to where I'm going. And I love Thomas. Thomas represents me. I'm a questions guy. Some of you know, you, you, you can relate to Thomas. Thomas is like, oh, well, hold on, Lord, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, we don't know where you're going and we don't know the way. And Jesus, so patient, answers with those famous words when he says, I am the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And by the way, no one gets to the Father except through me. So lastly, I would ask you then, we looked at the criminal number one, we looked at criminal number two, and I would ask you, what is the cross to you today? And don't take me wrong, I'm not suggesting you're criminals. But God's word says we're all sinners. God's word says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And it's only through his life, his death, and his resurrection that we're saved. The message of the cross is the power of God. The Greek word for power is dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. It is also a word in Greek for miracle. And so the message of the cross, in other words, to me anyway, is a powerful dynamic or powerful as dynamite and is the greatest miracle ever. The greatest of all miracles. And Jesus did a lot of miracles. So why would I say that? I would say that because of this. It's the only event in human history that has ever defeated the most powerful, the most unavoidable force on the earth, and that is death. What's more powerful than death? What's the one thing that money can never buy, that status cannot defeat, that politics cannot overcome, 
that all of us await, no matter how powerful you are, and that is death. Death has been described as that cliff that we're all headed toward and no one wants to talk about it. Death is something that we're all appointed to face one day. We don't like it, but guess what? God didn't like it either, and that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to conquer death, and that's the greatest miracle of all, that through his death, we too conquer death. Of all the miracles ever performed, None are as great and powerful as this. So to those folks that day Jesus was crucified, to them the cross was a sign of torture. To many today, it's a piece of jewelry we wear or something we hang in our home. To them that day, it was a sign of fear. To us today, it's a sign of freedom. To them that day, it was a sign of death. To us today, it's a sign of life. To them, it was a sign of, it was the end. To us, it's a sign of a new beginning. To them, it represents guilt and shame. To us today, it represents salvation. It represents conquering death. Jesus said it himself. John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life for those who come to me. Though they die, yet shall they live. And he ended that with a question. Do you believe this? Without the empty tomb that we're going to celebrate next week, I want to encourage you. Invite someone. Did you know that there are people that will come Easter that won't come any other time? But do you know there's people that or apprehensive about visiting a new church, and a simple invitation can take that away. What if every one of you brought someone next week? I said that in the first service, but all of them were leaving. (laughs) Maybe that's not the case in this service. (laughs) Invite someone. Without the empty tomb, the cross would not be all these things I've just shared with you. But the empty tomb proves that the message of the cross is the power of God. And the empty tomb could not happen until Jesus willingly died on the cross. And what amazes me the most about Scripture is that it teaches us the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is the same power that's available to us today. That's unreal to me. Would you bow your heads with me? Would you give God a moment to speak to your heart today? I just got a simple challenge. Just talk to Jesus the way the thief on the cross did. The thief on the cross had nothing to offer Jesus. He had no money. He was nailed to a cross. He had no power. He had no influence. And he was running out of time real fast. He had nothing to offer Jesus but himself. But himself. Just surrender today and say, Jesus, remember me. Jesus, I am yours today. I surrender my life my will to your will. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us so much that you provided a way for us to have access to God the Father. And that way is Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your life, your death, and your resurrection. And thank you for conquering death for me. That death has such a grip on people and it's It's something that we fear, but through you, death now is a doorway in which we step through into eternal life. And if there's anyone here today that does not have that assurance, I pray, God, you draw them to you. 
In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you, Chad. We're going to go ahead and, and sing a couple more songs. And as always, if during that time, uh, God's touched your heart today, and you've never given your life to Christ, and you've never uh, decided to take that step, uh, probably one of the saddest things I deal with in the ministry is seeing someone who needs Christ and Jesus, but they just can't let go, and they got to hang on. So as we sing these songs, I'm going to be actually out in the hallway down to the end of the the hall there. If you need to talk, you need to have prayer, then I invite you to come down there and I'd be happy to meet with you. And Or if it doesn't work for you today, some other time, seek me out and uh, we will share together. So uh, make that part of your heart. And forgot to announce this earlier, we're going to have a good Friday service this, Sunday, this uh, Friday at 630 to come and reflect even more on the power of the cross. So it doesn't happen today. It, it may happen down to the, the cross is always there. And Friday we'll gather at 6.30 here and, and uh, ponder that some more. So let God work on your heart. Let's all stand as we sing these songs. If you have something on your heart, be glad to meet with you. <laughs>